Hi class, I hope everyone's doing fine. And in this lecture video, we are going to discuss the second part for the topic in Bio 108 and that is Nerve Physiology. We will begin our discussion in the cellular elements of the nervous system. First of which is the neuron. Shown in the screen is a typical neuron structure which consists of a dendritic region, the somatic region, and the axonic region. Dendrites are processes that extend from the soma or the cell body. Its function is to receive information from other neurons and sensory receptors. These sensory receptors perceive stimuli that provides information about what is happening in the environment. It can be both from the external and the internal environment. Any information that dendrites receive from sensory receptors will be transmitted to the cell body. Now, the cell body contains the typical organelles of the cell, such as the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, and the Golgi apparatus. In this region is where the information perceived from the environmental stimuli is converted or being processed. That is, neurotransmitters or chemical messengers are synthesized and transported from this region to the axon. Next part is the axon hyalac, the region where the plasma membrane generates nerve impulses. From the soma is another projection called the axon. The axon transmits nerve impulse away from the soma down its length to the axon terminal. Other structure found in the axon is the telodendria. These are divisions or branches formed by the axon. At the end of this telodendron is an axon terminal. The axon terminal connects with a variety of other structures including dendrites, cell bodies, axons of other neurons, or non-neural tissue such as muscle or glandular tissue. Neurons can also be divided into three functional classes. If we will look the graph, sensory neurons are connected in the sensory receptors and transmit information perceived by the senses to the central nervous system. While interneurons, since it is located within the central nervous system, are the central nodes of neural circuits enabling communication between the sensory or motor neurons and the central nervous system. The motor or efferent neurons are neurons that carry information from the central nervous system to the effector organs. This is to elicit the response from the stimuli processed by the central nervous system. So aside from the neuron, another cellular element of the nervous system is the glial cells. Glia or the neuroglia are non-neural cells in the nervous system which are found both in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system that do not produce electrical impulses. So how neurons work? They work by generation and conduction of action potentials. These action potentials are waves of electrical energy that pass along the neuron from the dendrites to the cell body to the axon. This will only happen when the membrane of a neuron is electrically unstable, meaning the potential difference that exists across the neuronal cell membrane can transiently change. So, before the action potential is being generated, it is necessary to look at the electrical activity of the neuronal cell membrane at rest, and that is called as the resting membrane potential. Now, this figure illustrates the resting membrane potential or the RMP. In most neurons, the resting membrane potential has a value of approximately negative 70 millivolts or negative 75 millivolts. That is, the inside of the cell or the cytosol has approximately 75 millivolts more negative than the outside of the cell. Note that this number, negative 70 or negative 75 millivolts, varies by neuron type and by species. The resting membrane potential is mostly determined by the concentrations of the ions, 
in the fluids on both sides of the cell. From this figure, the cytosol is the inside of the cell while this one is the outside of the cell. These are the ions found at the outside and the ions found in the inside. In the membrane, there are carrier proteins or transport proteins that carries the ion from the inside to outside of the cell or carries ion from the outside to the inside of the cell. So basically, distribution of ions across the neuronal membrane is not equal. Remember that negative resting membrane potential is maintained by increasing the concentration of cations or positively charged ions outside the cell relative to the inside of the cell. Meaning, the inside of the cell is more negative in charge compared to the outside of the cell. In neurons, potassium ions are maintained at high concentrations in the cytosol while sodium ions are maintained at high concentrations outside of the cell. So remember that more potassium are maintained inside of the cell and more sodium are maintained outside of the cell. Therefore, the cell possesses potassium and sodium leakage channels that allow the two cations to diffuse down their concentration gradient, meaning uh, down their concentration gradient from higher concentration of ions to the lower concentration of ions. Since more potassium is inside the cell, it will move down its concentration gradient. Potassium will move from the inside to the outside of the cell. While the opposite is true for sodium, down its concentration gradient, sodium will move from outside of the cell to the inside of the cell since most sodium ions are found outside the cell. However, neurons have far more potassium leakage channels than sodium leakage channels. Therefore, potassium diffuses out of the cell at a much faster rate than the sodium leaks inside the cell. So, because more cations are leaving the cell than entering, this causes the interior of the cell to be more negatively charged relative to to the outside of the cell. So the loss of potassium ions across the membrane cannot continue indefinitely because the buildup of positive charge on the outside of the neuron will prevent further movement of potassium ions outwards as like charges repel. At this point, there will be a dynamic equilibrium between the movement of potassium out of the cell down its concentration gradient and the movement of potassium back into the cell down its electrical gradient. Remember that the inside of the neuron is now slightly negatively charged. So in terms of electrical gradient, potassium is now attracted to go back inside the cell because the cell is now negative in charge and potassium is positively charged. This situation is called an electrochemical equilibrium. This means that the electrical and concentration gradient are now equal and opposite to each other. Therefore, at this point, there is no further net movement of potassium ions. Now, an action potential occurs when the membrane of a specific cell location rapidly rises and falls. That is, when the inside of the neuron changes from being at rest or from being negatively charged to now positively charged. A threshold, approximately negative 50 millivolts, a positive feedback mechanism is initiated. Initial entry of sodium ions into the cell may lead to further entry of more sodium ions and so on. This initial change in the membrane is known as depolarization at 30 millivolts. As soon as the sodium ions have opened, they close and further series of potassium ions open. This causes the membrane to begin to return to its resting value and this is termed as repolarization. This results in the removal of positively charged inside of the cell because potassium diffuses out of the cell. Too much positive charge is lost from the neuron will result to a more negative charge cytoplasm at negative 70 millivolts 
and this condition is termed as hyperpolarization. So remember that if the exit of potassium ions out of the cell maintains a resting membrane potential, the entry of sodium in the cell initiates action potential. Another thing to consider is the refractory period of the neuron. This can be divided into two components. The first is the absolute refractory period. During this time, it is impossible to generate a second action potential in the neuron due to the inactivation of the sodium channels. The second component is the relative refractory period. In this case, it is possible to generate a second action potential in the neuron. But to be able to do so, it requires an increased stimulus. So, for the relative refractory period to happen, any depolarizing response such as sodium entry, which are essential for action potential, must be able to overcome the hyperpolarizing response due to the loss of potassium ions inside the cell. Synapses or neuronal junction is the site of transmission of electrical nerve impulse between two nerve cell or neurons or between a neuron and a gland or a muscle cell. Electrical epapses or synapses are by far the simplest mechanism by which an action potential can be transferred from one neuron to another. In this situation, the pre- and post-synaptic membrane lie close to each other as shown from this image, forming a cell-to-cell -cell contact known as a gap junction or a connexon. A connexon is consists of a protein structure linking the membranes of the two cells. This allows ions to pass from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. The gap junction may open and close, allowing or preventing an action potential to pass from one neuron to the next. This allows action potential to travel in one direction only, from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. Depolarization of the synaptic terminal results in an influx of calcium. The calcium enters through ion channels which have opened in response to depolarization. The effect of calcium influx is to activate the enzyme calcium calmodulin dependent protein kinase 1. This enzyme, like any other kinase, phosphorylates substrates. In the case of this particular enzyme, the substrate that is phosphorylated is known as synapsin. Synapsin is attached to the vesicle which contains the neurotransmitter substance. When phosphorylated, synapsin detaches from the vesicle allowing the vesicle to uh, fuse with the presynaptic membrane. By a process of exocytosis, the neurotransmitter is released into the synapse where it diffuses across and combines with a specific receptor on the postsynaptic membrane. So once the neurotransmitter has combined with its receptor, it is able to influence the membrane potential of the postsynaptic neuron in one of the two ways. The receptor may form a large ion channel or receptor complex. Thus, when the receptor is activated by the neurotransmitter, this may lead to conformational change in the structure of the ion channel. This in turn will open the channel allowing the passage of ions across the membrane and leading to a change in the membrane potential. This mechanism is shown in figure labeled 5 as projected in the screen. Another way is when the receptor is activated, it may produce a second messenger molecule such as the CAMP or what is known as cyclic adenosine monophosphate. The second messenger may in turn influence the state of opening of an ion channel and therefore alter the membrane potential. Having stimulated a postsynaptic neuron, a neurotransmitter must be rapidly inactivated. This must be done to prevent excessive stimulation of the postsynaptic cell. The simplest way in which neurotransmitters are removed from a synapse is metabolism of the substance in the synapse. As shown in the figure, acetylcholine is rapidly broken down by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. The acetate re-enters 
the circulation and choline is actively transported back into the presynaptic neuron where it can resynthesize into acetylcholine. Another way of removing neurotransmitters from the synapse is to transport them into cells through ion channels or by diffusion and break them down intracellularly. The type of channels opened as a result of the neurotransmitter combining with its receptor will determine whether the postsynaptic cell is excited or inhibited. Excitatory postsynaptic potentials or EPSP are those which depolarize and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials or IPSP are those which hyperpolarize. So, as shown in the figure, EPSP, since it excites, it produces a depolarizing response. However, if the threshold is not reached, in this case, negative 55 millivolts is not reached, no action potential is generated. IPSP, since it inhibits, it produces a hyperpolarizing response. So that ends our discussion for the topic nerve physiology. If you have questions and in need of clarifications, please feel free to contact me or post it in the questions and concerns forum of our Mole classroom. Thank you and good day. See you again in our next session.